going to cover section 7b, which is all about combining probabilities. In our last video, we talked briefly about the introduction to probability, how we express probability as a fraction, where the numerator are the desired outcomes and the denominator are all possible outcomes. Now we're going to go one step further. We're going to talk about different probabilities that can occur and how we calculate them. So we'll start by looking at 7b's lecture notes, which pretty much just talk about independent events first, the difference between independent and dependent events. So what makes an event independent and what makes it uh, an event dependent? Well, we'll start with the independent events. Two events, are in, or two events are independent if the outcome of one does not affect the probability of the other event. So in other words, if you have two, two events that you're interested in and one has no bearing whatsoever on the outcome of the other, then we can say those two events are independent. And if each of those events have a probability, let's say the probability of me wearing shorts today is one-fourth, and the probability of you wearing sandals today is one-eighth. And those two probabilities have no bearing on each other whatsoever, meaning we don't, we don't even care what the weather is. We just wear shorts and sandals whenever we want. And you could say then the probability of A is one-fourth, probability of B is one-eighth, and if these are independent, then the probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A. Oops, sorry. Probability of A times the probability of B. And this principle can be extended to any number of independent events. So in other words, it doesn't necessarily have to be just two of them. Let's say I wanted to roll a die in this first example that we have here. Let's say I have a die in my hand and I'm going to roll it. And I want to roll three sixes in a row. So each time I roll a six, it's completely independent of the previous roll because there was no influence on the first roll happening that could change the outcome of the second or the third row. So we can say that rolling three die, uh, rolling a die three times in a row and getting sixes each time is going to be independent. So how do I calculate that? Well, I find the probability of rolling a six. So the probability of rolling a six, we can see is one out of six. The die has six different numbers to choose from. To roll the number six, there's only one way of doing that. And so we can express that probability as one out of six. If I want to do that three times in a row, I need to multiply one over six times itself. Then I would say one out of six times one out of six times one out of six. Multiplying fractions is just going straight across. 1 times 1 times 1 is still 1. 6 times 6 is 36 times another 6 is 216. And so if I had the opportunity to roll a die three times in a row and the same number came up, it doesn't necessarily have to be a 6. It could have been a 4 or it could have been a 2. There's still six different numbers on the die. and I still have one way of rolling whatever particular number I was interested in. So to roll that same number three times in a row would be 1 out of 216. Then we have to talk about dependent events. So dependent events happen when the outcome of one event influences the outcome of another. When that happens, probability is calculated a little bit different. So it tells us here that if we're dealing with dependent events, We calculate the probability of the first event happening, and we multiply that by the probability of the second event happening, given that the first event happened. That sounds a little compl complicated, but really what happens usually in these problems is our denominator somehow changes in that second calculation, and we have to consider that denominator change before we go and we multiply. The example that we have here is a really good one. Let's do this jury selection example together. It says a three-person jury must be selected at random from a pool that has six men and six women. What is the probability of selecting an all-male jury? Okay, so let's write out some important information about this jury before we go and we calculate. We have 12 members total. 
six men. And six women. We want to calculate the probability of selecting three men from the group of 12. So our first fraction here is going to be the total number of people and the numerator of the fraction is going to be the total number of men we have to choose from. In this first choice, we have 12 members total, and we have six men to choose from. So the first probability that we would calculate comes out to just six out of 12. Now that changes though, because remember, we wanna choose three men total. So this is just the probability of choosing the first man. So let's make two more fractions here. Next to it, I'll make another fraction, and then I'll make another fraction where I can calculate the probability of the second choice and of the third choice. Now I just chose one of the men out of the 12 members total. So now I remove that person from the list and in the second choice I only have 11 members to choose from because one has already been chosen. The person that was chosen was a man. So in the second probability I only have five men left to choose out of. So of those 11 people that are left, five of them are men. And I want to choose one of those five men. So in the last choice, I only have 10 people to choose from. And of those 10 people, four of them are men. Then we can multiply this across. You can either give me the fraction or the decimal representation of this number. But when we multiply straight across, before we reduce, we get something like 120 over 1320. We can take a common zero off of the end. I can say this looks like 12 out of 132. And even that can be simplified into 1 out of 11. And you could give me this fraction right here. You have a 1 out of 11 chance of choosing three men in a row. Or um, as we saw in the notes, you can give me the decimal representation. If you're using the decimal representation in the homework, be careful that you round to the proper decimal place. In this one, we would write this as 0 0.09, and actually it's 090909 forever, but in here we rounded to three decimal places and we called it 091. Either one of those representations of the probability is acceptable. So then we move on and we want to talk about either or probabilities. What is the probability of this or this happening? So there are two different kinds of events where this can happen. Either, either or probabilities can either happen in events that overlap or events that do not. The first example we'll look at are two events that are non-overlapping. Two events that are non-overlapping means both events can't possibly happen at the same time. Either one event happens or the other. This is the easier case of or probabilities. For non-overlapping events, the probability of A or B is simply just the probability of A plus the probability of B. The example here says, suppose you roll a single die, what's the probability of rolling either a two or a three? Because we're rolling a single die, the denominator is going to be six, and there's only one way of rolling a two, so we would have a one out of six chance of rolling a two. We also have a one out of six chance of rolling a three. Remember, the key word in here is or. This is not an and probability. This is an or. We want either one or the other to happen. And so we add 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 is 2 over 6, or 1 third. Now, probabilities can overlap. The most common situation that you would see an overlapping probability would be in cards. So that's the one we're going to look at now.
So for overlapping, what's happening in an overlapping set is that we're trying to count all the different ways that things can happen. But in the process, we usually end up double counting something. So cards is a really good example. The example that we're looking at right here gives us a deck of cards and it asks us what's the probability of, of flipping a card over and it being a queen or a club. What's the probability of drawing a queen or club? And this picture that we have over here on the side really demonstrates it very well. What we can see is that there are four queens and there are 13 clubs. So without any overlapping, we would just say that there are four plus 13 or 17 cards that we could choose from that are either a queen or a club. The problem with that though is if we look in the middle, there's one card that satisfies both of those definitions. It's a queen and it's a club. And so unfortunately, I counted it in my queens. I could write out four queens here with heart and diamond and spade and club. And then I could write out all my 13 clubs. Ace of clubs, two of clubs, three of clubs, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, and king. Sorry, off the page. All of clubs. And you can see that there is one of them. I didn't draw a club next to all these. Just assume that they all have little clubs next to them. But we can see, just like that picture, that there's one of them that we would double count. And so this is what helps us build the formula for overlapping. We can say for the probability of overlapping, the probability of A or B is going to be equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap, which we refer to as probability of A and B. Probability of A and B in this problem would be a queen and a club, which does exist. There's one of them. And so the way that we'll write this out is probability of queen plus probability of club. Bear with me with these terrible pictures. It would be better if it was actually focused. There we go. Minus probability of queen of clubs. We said that there are four queens out of the deck of 52 cards. There are 13 club cards out of the deck of 52. But we have to subtract that one that we double counted. There is only one queen of clubs. So we get. 16 out of 52, which we can simplify into 4 out of 13. The last example we'll do from 7b talks about the at least rule. I put it in here and I even labeled it as more difficult material because it pops up in the homework, but I highly doubt I would ever examine you on this style of question. What it asks is the at least one rule goes back to what we talked about in 7a. 7a, remember we talked about the not probability, the probability of not a. Remember that the probability of not a is 1 minus, oops, the probability of not a is 1 minus the probability of a because the probability of something happening plus the probability of it not happening is always equal to one. In other words, if there was a 20% chance of rain today, then there is an 80% chance there is not rain today. So the 20% plus 80% is 100%. And remember, as a decimal, 100% is expressed as one. So with that in mind, what we're doing is we're using that property here to express an easier way of calculating a lot of events happening at once. So let's look at this example. It says, find the probability of at least one head when you toss three coins. Okay, so we're gonna 
toss three coins. And we want at least, at least one head. Well, what does at least one head really mean? Well, at least one head could mean one head. It could be two heads. It could be three heads. These events are independent of one another. So if I wanted to calculate this by hand, what I'd have to do is find the probability of getting one head, the probability of getting two heads, the probability of getting three heads, and add all of those values together, which is kind of a long process. Turns out there's an easier way for us to do that. Instead of calculating all three of those, the opposite of at least one head, of at least one, is no heads. So sometimes, instead of having to calculate separate event probabilities independently, it's easier for us to calculate the opposite probability and then do 1 minus that value. In this case, it's much easier for us to calculate the probability of getting no heads and then taking 1 minus that value. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do 1 minus the probability of no heads. And remember, we're doing three tosses here. So this is going to be 1 minus. Now, how do you achieve getting no heads if you toss three coins? Well, I'd have to get tails all three times. To get tails the first time would be 1 half. To get tails the second time, the probability is 1 half. And to get tails the third time, the probability is 1 half. And so getting no heads when you flip a coin three times is the same as saying a 1 in 8 probability. Because we want the opposite probability to occur, we're going to subtract 1 minus 1 8. We get least common denominator. That's 8 over 8 minus 1 over 8, which gives us 7 over 8. On your own, try to do this problem without using the 1 minus rule. In other words, find the probability of 1 head, 2 heads, and 3 heads, and add these values together. You should also get 7 out of 8 for your answer. So the last thing we're going to do in this section is look at an example from the homework, because the homework is always daunting in Chapter 7. So just grab a random one. This looks like number 4. It says, determine whether the following events are independent or dependent, then find the probability of the combined event. We're going to draw three black cards in a row from a standard deck of cards when the drawn card is not returned to the deck each time. Let's bring up the whiteboard. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry, I didn't expect this to take this long. There. Okay. So this problem says, we're going to draw three black cards in a row from a standard deck of cards. And the deck is not returned, the card is not returned to the deck. This is the most important part of the question. So if the, if the card is not returned to the deck each time, then what happens is, just like in that jury problem, we have a different denominator each time. In the beginning, when we draw that first card, there are 52 cards to choose from. But when I draw the second time, because I'm not putting the card back in the deck, I only have 51 cards to choose from. And the third time, I will only have 50 cards to choose from. So, are these events independent? Turns out, no. These events are dependent, because the outcome of one is going to affect the outcome of another. If I do draw that black card, now my denominator is changed, and the numerator is changed. If I don't draw a black card, the denominator will still change, but the numerator will not. These are dependent events. Yay, fantastic. Now we calculate the probability. 
the probability of drawing three black cards in a row. Remember that in a standard deck of cards, there are 52 total. Half of them are black, and half of them are red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make three blank spaces here, and I will label them first, second, and third draw. So in that first draw, I have 26 cards to choose from. I'm sorry, I have 52 total cards to choose from, and I have 26 of them that will satisfy what I'm looking for. I want a black card in the beginning. Then in the second toss, I've chosen a black card. So my denominator is going to decrease by one. And also my numerator is going to decrease by one because I had 26 black cards to choose from, and I took one of them in the first choice. Now I only have 25 left. And then lastly, in third choice, I have 50 cards to choose from. 24 of them satisfy what I'm looking for. So I'm going to multiply all of these values together. In this problem, it told me to type an integer or a simplified fraction. So this is a good one for the calculator because I want to simplify this as much as I can. I'm going to do my best to simplify these fractions by hand, frankly, because I don't have my calculator with me. 26 out of 52 is 1 half times 25 over 51 times 24 over 50. Remember, you can cross cancel in the uh, fraction. So I have a 25 right here and a 50 right here. I cancel the 25 and it becomes a 1. I cancel the 50 and it becomes a 2. I can also cancel this 24 and this 2 by taking a 2 out of each of those. The 2 is going to go completely away to a 1. 24 reduces to a 12. I have one more cancellation because I have a 2 down here. This 2 cancels and the 12 divides in half and becomes a 6. So on the top I have 1 times 1 times 6 and on the bottom I have 1 times 51 times 1 which is 6 over 51. Oh, that actually can be simplified even more because 51 is divisible by 3. So I'm going to take a 3 out of each of these and I get 2 out of 17 as its most simplified form. Your calculator would have done that a whole lot faster, so please use it. We get 2 out of 17, and we're done. Yay! So that's it for Section 7b. Soon you'll see the uh, lecture video for Section 7c coming up soon, as well as the mini project. Any project isn't overwhelming. It's just looking at rolling dice and seeing if we can make some connections between what happens when we do things over and over again. How does the theoretical probability approach, or as, how does the uh, empirical probability approach the theoretical probability? In other words, how do the trials look as we do it over and over again? They should be trending more towards what we expect to happen.